You can get a better assessment of the true health of a church by conversations in a church lobby than you can by what's happening on stage or by the numbers in the books. Hi, I'm Carl Vaders, and welcome to The Church Lobby, Conversations on Faith and Ministry. This episode begins a short series within this podcast about my new book, Desizing the Church, How Church Growth Became a Science, Then an Obsession, and What's Next, that just released on April the 2nd. We have an unhealthy relationship with bigness in the church. So a few years ago, I looked around and asked myself, where did this obsession with bigness come from? Because things don't come from nowhere. So I did a deep dive into church growth history, which turned into a deep dive into American history, which turned into a deep dive into the way our cities are structured and built and the nature of celebrity and a whole bunch of things that all came together into the book, Desizing the Church. So for these next several episodes, uh, we're going to be talking with various people, most of whom I quoted in the book, to go a little bit deeper into some of the subject matter of the book. But I want to start today with an outline of what the book is about to give you an idea of what to expect, what's coming up, and what Desizing the Church is all about. So I wrote this book, Desizing the Church, How Church Growth Became a Science, Then an Obsession, and What's Next. So I'm not going to give you the entire book in this process because, well, I want you to go out and buy it. I want you to be able to read it and get into some deeper things. But I do want to spend some time talking about it, and we want to give you some episodes of the podcast to give you a little bit of a deeper dive and to have some conversations with people who are really vital to the message of this book. But what I want to do in this episode is I want to walk you through five questions and then give you the answers to each of these five questions. So here are the five questions up front. We're going to look at what is desizing. Secondly, why do we need to desize? Thirdly, where did our obsession with bigness come from? Which, of course, is the question I had at the very beginning that inspired the book to begin with. And question number four will be, what are the dangers of pursuing bigness? And then five, how do we fix this? That's kind of the general outline of the book. So I'm going to give you the framework and a template for it as we go through this in this episode. So question number one is this, what is desizing? Okay, let me get there this way. Numbers define us. They shouldn't, but they do. We've seen it in the church world as well as we've seen it anywhere else. The pastor of a church of 3,000 is given more credibility than a pastor of a church of 300 and way more than the pastor of a church of 30. But you are not your numbers. This has been the primary message of this ministry for over a decade now. You are not your numbers. Neither is the church you serve. Your value is not defined by numbers. Your church's de- value is not defined by numbers. But I need to keep saying it because we often still default to that because we have this unhealthy relationship with bigness in the church and especially in the American church. And this unhealthy relationship with size and our obsession with bigness is killing us. It's literally killing us and our churches. I'm convinced that the rate of pastoral departures and burnout that is at record levels and growing is in big part to be attributed to our obsession with bigness. So before we get to any more of that, let's define it. What is bigness. Well, first of all, it's a term I made up, so I get to define it. That's a lot of fun. I encourage you making up terms because then you can define it. So here's how I define it. We'll do it in two ways. Definition number one is this. Desizing is the process of assessing the value of something without obsessing over numbers. And definition number two is, in the church, choosing to evaluate the health and vitality of a congregation, a denomination, or a movement without using attendance figures, percentages, or numerical comparisons as the primary consideration. Now, I want you to note the key words in both of those definitions are obsessing and primary. There's nothing wrong with using numbers. It's okay to count what counts. 
But our obsession with numbers as the primary and sometimes the only way to assess a minister's or a church's viability is a huge problem. Here's how I reference it early in the book, and let me give you a direct quote, because I believe this quote is at the heart of the problem we're dealing with, and it's definitely at the heart of how I define desizing in my book. Quote, our obsession, not just with numbers, but with big numbers, may be the major but least acknowledged contributing factor in pastoral burnout, church scandals, divisiveness, misallocation of resources, and many other church dysfunctions. Yes, I'm convinced that our obsession with numbers and our obsession with bigness is the least acknowledged major contributor to all of those problems. So, how is it a problem? Now that we've defined desizing, we have to ask ourselves, why do we need to desize? Well, in the middle of the book, I actually give a survey that you can fill out that's labeled, do I need to desize? Because some of us may not think this is a problem for us. We may be reading the book, you know, thinking this all applies to somebody else. But my guess is it applies to most of us in one way or another. So I'm going to give it to you in the audio version. Uh, in the show notes, it'll tell you where to go, where you can actually take it online for yourself and actually assess the numbers properly. But this will give you an overview. There are 10 questions, and you can answer each question all the way from always, which gives you a five, to usually for four, often for three, sometimes two, seldom one, never zero. You may need to listen back to get that again, but here they are. Here are the 10 questions to ask yourself and rate yourself on. One, when you describe how well or poorly your church is doing, do you tend to use numbers? Two, is your mood or behavior significantly affected by your church's attendance numbers? Three, do you ever exaggerate your church's attendance figures? Four, do you ever interpret a drive for bigger numbers as an expression of greater faith? Five, do you ever feel like your church or ministry is less valuable than someone else's because yours is smaller, or that a church is better because it's bigger? Six, do you feel personal pride when your church numbers increase, or shame when they decrease? Seven, do you believe pastors of larger churches are more qualified to teach you about ministry than those who serve in smaller churches? Eight, have you ever overlooked someone's questionable moral behavior, possibly your own, because of numerical results? 9. Do you assume a church must be stuck or broken if attendance isn't increasing? And 10. Can you describe what a healthy church looks like without using numbers? Assess each of those from always 5 to 0 never, and then give yourself a total. And basically the way it comes out is this. How did you do? 0 to 5, congratulations, you have desized. 6 to 20, not bad, but if these results are higher than you expected, you may have some work to do. And if you are 21 to 35, you have a lot of work to do. And if you have above that 35 to 50, you really have some serious issues with bigness and with size. So your bigger your number, the more work you have to do. So desizing is an issue, I think, for all of us to some degree or another. And hopefully that little survey will give you an idea of where you stand on that. But the question then becomes, where did our obsession with bigness come from? That's question number three that I want to deal with. We become obsessed with bigness at almost all costs, and it's cost us an awful lot. So Here's the beginning idea of where it came from, and it actually goes back to an illustration from me in my college years, my pre-Bible college years. For the first two years, I went to, got all my general education at a local junior college so I could get it for free, and then I went from my last two years to a Bible college. And in one of my first classes, as a young teenager, fresh out of high school and going into college, I had an Economics 101 class. And in that class, on the first day of class, the economics teacher got up and put one of the overhead slides on the overhead projector for anybody younger. Let's just pretend he had a laptop and he put it up on the screen. And what he did was he put a he put a values slide on on the screen. And what it was was it was like a word cloud of words like faith, happiness, family, community, integrity, justice mercy. And it was a list of all of these wonderful virtues and values, and they were just all over the screen. And he said, you see all those words there? Those and the principles behind them are the things that really matter in your life. And I thought, 
is this an economics class or an ethics class? What's going on here? Because everything on that slide was good. Yeah, those are the things that matter in life. And then he took the slide off and he put up another slide and that slide had just the word money in big letters in the middle of it. He said, those things are what matter, but this money is what we're going to talk about for the next 13 weeks. We are going to talk about money like it is what, the only thing that matters. We're going to talk how, about how to earn it, about how to spend it, about how to save it, about how to invest it, about how it affects international markets. For 13 weeks, we are going to talk about money like it is the only thing that matters in your life. But it's not. The first slide is the thing that's things that matter in your life. And I thought, oh, that's fair. You know, it's an economics class and it's nice for him to frame it that way for us. So we did the 13 weeks. We talked for 13 weeks about how money was the as if money was the only thing that mattered in the entire world. And then in the last class, after he uh, after we took our finals and he collected all the papers, he gathered us together again and he put the money slide back on the on, on the overhead. And he said, we've been talking for 13 weeks like this is the only thing that matters. It's not. Then he put back the original slide with that word cloud of all those values words on it and said, remember, these are the things that matter. Have a great summer and head off. So we did. And I noticed something. The first week when he put up the values slide, everybody around the room might have been a little confused, but they were nodding in agreement. After 13 weeks, when they put up the values slide, the room had shifted. They looked at it like, yeah, sure. Like maybe I'm you know, being a little judgmental on it, but I can read body language pretty well. And that room had shifted. At the beginning, they were like, yeah, those are the important things in life. But after talking about money relentlessly for 13 weeks, as if it's the only thing that matters in our lives, when he put up the values later, everybody's mood had shifted and they went, well, that's what we're pretending matters, but People's attitudes had shifted with just 13 weeks talking about money. So what does this have to do with the church growth movement? Well, here's what I kind of believe has happened, what I've seen happen in the last 40 years. When we go to our church growth conferences, we talk about matters of faith and of scripture and of theology and of integrity. And we say, these are the things that really matter. And we really believe it. But then we've spent 40 years as if the only word on the slide in front of us are the words church growth. We got to get our numbers up. And if in 13 weeks of talking about money, we can shift the attitude of a room full of students, how much more has our attitude shifted in 40 years of relentlessly talking about church growth, getting our numbers up as if it's the only thing that matters? This is a natural result of that kind of obsession. So the question then becomes, okay, where did that obsession come from? Why is it that for the last 40 years we've been talking about numerical church growth as not even just the primary, but sometimes the only thing we talk about in certain circles within church leadership? Well, here's the research that I did. I'm going to do it very quickly for you for time's sake. Uh, we'll go into it much more detail. When you pick up the book, you can read more. It turns out there wasn't one church growth movement, there were two. The first church growth movement I talk about in the book is what I call the McGavran Street. Donald McGavran was a missionary to India from the 1920s to the early 1950s. And as he was being a missionary in India, he started hearing about entire villages coming to Christ altogether. And at first he thought, oh, that's crazy. That can't be happening. But he was a researcher, so he actually went out and found these villages to discover, is this actually happening? And what he found was that, yeah, it's actually happening. Entire villages are coming to Christ at the same time. So he thought, oh, I want to figure out how and why this is happening to see if we can use the principles that God is doing here and see if they can be used elsewhere as well. I want more people to come to Jesus. So he studied this for his few remaining years in India. And then before he retired, he took a tour through Africa where similar things were happening in several countries there. He then came home and finished up his first book on this phenomenon, which he entitled The Bridges of God because the idea is how does God build these bridges from himself to people in a way that so many people want to come to Christ at the same time. In this book, for the first time ever in print, he coined the term church growth and many of the other terms that we use in the church growth movement that we take for granted today. He went through a couple different steps, but at 1965, at 68 years of age, Donald McGavran started the Church Growth Institute at Fuller in Pasadena, and this is the locus for the church growth movement for the ensuing 40 to 50 or more years.
At first, when he started the university, he actually had requirements that excluded most uh, American pastors. One, you had to have field experience outside the U.S. Two, you had to be fluent in a language other than English. And three, you had to have wide knowledge of that uh, extra cultural field and its mission and its ind indigenous churches. And because of these requirements, it excluded 99.9% .9 of pastors. And he did this on purpose because he figured if we as Americans got a hold of the principles he was talking about in his book, that we would turn them into a way of how do I make my church bigger rather than how do people movements come to Christ. But his book was out there, and American pastors were reading the book and were fascinated by the ideas in the book. So they kept coming to him and asking him, okay, you need to teach us too. We want to be in this class. He relented on it, and he pushed it back for seven years until in 1972, at the age of 75, he finally gave in to the overwhelming demand, and he taught a class with C. Peter Wagner that included American pastors. And that class is considered the spark that started the modern American church growth movement. Okay? What did we do with it? We did it with it exactly what he feared, which is we turned it into a contest of big churches rather than how do people movements come to Christ. So, why did we do that? Why did McGavran anticipate that we might do that? Because his church growth stream is not the only church growth stream going on. And now a short break to talk about something else. If you like the content you're hearing, here are two things you can do for us. First, forward this podcast to a friend. Second, consider becoming a financial supporter through Patreon, Venmo, or PayPal. Just go to carlvaders.com support. For as little as $3 a month, you can help us put these resources into the hands of the ministries that need them the most. Our support link is in the show notes. Before Donald McGavern came along, we had the American church growth stream already going. So let me walk you through that. Why is bigness a primarily American obsession? It goes back to our founding. Back in the Constitution, and particularly in the Bill of Rights, starting with the First Amendment, the First Amendment said that the state cannot start or interfere with churches. That's not the phrasing you understand, but that's what it was. There's no state church anymore. Today, we understand it very differently than they understood it back then. One of the ways they understood it back then primarily was, okay, there's not going to be a church state. Like they came from England and there was a church of England. They came from Germany and there were official churches in Germany and unofficial churches in Germany. And almost all of the countries that the uh, writers and signers of the original documents that founded our nation, almost all of those writers and signers came from European countries where there were state churches. And here's the deal. If you have a state church, then you collect tithes for the church through the state taxes. It's hard for Americans to imagine this, but almost all of the countries that the founders of this nation came from didn't just have state churches, but they collected tithes for those churches from the state taxes. So when you paid your taxes, you were also paying your tithes, and then the government distributed those portions of the tithes to the churches. If you don't have a state church, however, and you don't have tithes being collected by the state to distribute to churches, which means every church, you can do what you want, but now you're on your own financially as well. So that meant that the pastors who could draw the bigger crowd and who out of that bigger crowd could get a bigger offering could build a bigger church. You getting the idea? Yeah. So this uh, size obsession in church was an unintended consequence of a great idea, the First Amendment, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. But it also disconnected us from the funding from the state. And so now we had to collect the funds on our own. And then that happens, and then the nation expands, and the nation is huge, and so you need big railways and big roadways and just basically big people to conquer this big land as we as we went out and did so uh, and made a whole bunch of horrific mistakes along the way while accomplishing some great things as well. Then you skip through a whole bunch of years and you have the rise of the suburbs. And one of the things that I was shocked about in the book was how the suburbs played a part in the building of the modern evangelical movement and especially the megachurches. I'll outline it really quick for you. When people lived in cities, they were close together. And when people lived on farms, the families worked together. 
But during the Great Migration, after people moved from farms and started overcrowding the cities, the cities weren't prepared to handle all the people that came into them. But then they started producing roadways and they started creating cars. And all of a sudden, people realized in the 1940s and especially 50s and 60s, wait a minute, I can work in this city, but I don't have to live in this city because my car will take me to a suburb in less than 30 minutes where my family can live safely during the day while I work in the city during the day. And if you move out of the city into a suburb, now you've got tons of land. And so the schools became bigger and the shopping malls developed, first shopping malls ever, and the stores became huge. The parks became huge. And guess what? The churches that followed along became huge as well because now they had space. So you combine all of this and all of a sudden the massive church in the suburb looks like the success story. And in fact, numerically, it does become the success story because that's where people are moving to. Donald McGavran knows all this. He knows about the American obsession with numbers. He's seen it happen. But what happened to us is we took these two streams and without realizing it, we are swimming in the American stream while using the language of the McGavran stream. And in some ways, McGavran's ideas and his terminology and his research methods got grafted into this relentlessly flowing American stream and his idea of, hey, how can entire people movements come to Christ? How can we increase the percentage of Christians within a given population became, how can I make my church bigger? And they melded and almost nobody recognized that they were melding. So that's where it came from. That's the bulk of the, the first third of the book. I hope you'll want to pursue that now because there's a whole lot about that that you can get into even deeper that will really help you understand how we got to where we are. So that's how we got where we are. The next question then is, what are these dangers? Is there a problem with pursuing bigness? Shouldn't we want things to be bigger? Is this a problem and why? So what are the dangers of pursuing bigness? And I'm going to give you three reasons. I'll give the three, the three dangers and then I'll, I'll explain them one at a time. The three dangers of pursuing bigness, or three of the dangers, they're not the only ones, but the three we'll go over now, are one, they get, it gives us an overconfidence in our abilities, two, an oversimplification of our goals, and three, an over-reliance on metrics. First of all, when we are pursuing bigness, it creates an overconfidence in our abilities. There's a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect, in essence, says when you start learning a little bit about something, your confidence level in your abilities and in your expertise in that thing skyrockets. Like you don't know anything about something and then you see a YouTube video and you go, oh, I'm an expert. Or you know nothing about ministry and you go to a semester of Bible college and you come out and go, wow, I've got all the answers, right? So when you first learn a little bit about something that you previously knew, knew nothing about, you start thinking you are all that. I call it in the book, the peak of overconfidence. So it's the brand new learner, the intern who thinks they know more than the seasoned pastor. So they start on the peak of overconfidence. However, if you continue to learn, and more than that, if you continue to have experience in that field, soon you start to learn, wait a minute, this thing when you actually try to do it is way harder than I thought and far more complicated. And you drop from the peak of overconfidence way down into what I call the valley of under underconfidence. You go from thinking you've got all the answers to thinking, this is too hard, I must be stupid, I should quit. This is actually where a lot of young pastors leave ministry thinking they're not called. They leave Bible college thinking they've got all the answers on the peak of overconfidence. They get into the pastorate, and within a year to 18 months to two years, they start realizing, this is so hard, way harder than I thought. I must not be called. And they leave in the valley of underconfidence. However, if you continue to learn, then because of the humility that the valley of underconfidence has brought, you can then start to learn at the same rate that your confidence increases. And that's something that you can sustain. So why am I telling you that? What does this have to do with the church growth movement? I believe that right now we are in the valley of underconfidence as far as the church growth movement is concerned. We've had 30 to 40 years of beginning to learn really new, really cool stuff about how churches grow. 
And so almost every church growth conference or, conference or church leadership conference you've been to has been from somebody who got it figured out in their place. Here's how our church grew really fast and here's how you can too. That's the peak of overconfidence. We're just learning these things. We're still in the length of church history. The last 40 years is just like watching a YouTube video, right? We've just gotten a couple things figured out with scientific method and with some new ideas. And we're going, wow, we've got the thing figured out now. And now in the last five to 10 years, we're looking around and going, well, maybe not so much. Maybe this is actually harder than we thought. It turns out there are a whole lot of small churches out there. And it turns out that a whole lot of the big churches that we were looking up to and the pastors that we were looking up to may not have been worth looking up to after all. And so now if you talk to pastors, they're not filled with overconfidence. They're filled with dread. They're filled with sadness. They're filled with fear. They're filled with exhaustion. And if you look around, there's a whole lot of bad news going around. I don't think this is a permanent state. I think this is a necessary drop from the arrogance of 20 or so years ago. And now we've got to go through that place to give us some humility. The good news is if we hang in there and we keep moving and we start learning more and we go back to the basic understanding of who and what God called his church to be, we can leave the overconfidence. We can get through our current underconfidence and we can start growing at a proper pace again where our knowledge and our experience grows at the same pace as our confidence in it. So when we are obsessed with bigness, we get overconfident in our abilities. We are now underconfident in our abilities in a lot of places, and we need to have a balance between the two. So that's the first danger of pursuing bigness, overconfidence in our abilities. The second danger of pursuing business is an oversimplification of our goals. For a good 30 to 40 years now, if a church is small, it is presumed unhealthy, and if a church is large, it is presumed to be healthy. All you need to do is see the promotion for a church growth co conference or a church growth book or somebody online telling you how to, you know, 10x the size of your church in the next two years, right? And it is presumed if your church is small, it is therefore stuck and it is a problem to fix. And if your church is big or getting bigger, it is then presumed you must be doing something right and you are healthy. And it's this linear view. On one side, you've got the small unhealthy churches, and on the other side, you've got the big and presumed healthy churches, and there are just shades in between, and that's all. I suggest that that is a very limited way to look at it, and it comes, this oversimplification of our goals that we just want to get bigger, comes from our obsession with bigness. If we step back a little bit, we will understand that not all big churches are healthy and not all small churches are unhealthy. We expand it out, and I do it in the book, to a two-dimensional graph where you've got four boxes. Bottom left, you've got the small and unhealthy church. Top right, you've got the big and healthy church. But you've also got the big and unhealthy church, and you've got the small and healthy church. So the question then, a better question then, is the church bigger and therefore we assume healthy? The question we have to ask is whether the church is big or small, is it healthy? And who should we be learning from? The big church that's unhealthy or the small church that's healthy? Or the big church that is healthy as well? So we can learn from healthy churches of all sizes, and we should not be learning from any church that's unhealthy, no matter how big it is. We need to expand our understanding of size and health rather than oversimplifying our goals. So those are the first two dangers of pursuing bigness, an overconfidence in our abilities and an oversimplification of our goals. The third danger is an over-reliance on metrics. One of the very positive results of the church growth movement is that they have given us and are continuing to give us better ways to measure results. This is positive. But every positive has potential negatives. And one of the potential negatives of a reliance on metrics is an over-reliance on metrics. So I have something in the book that I call the Goldilocks metrics, and that's basically this. We think that just getting more metrics is always, always better. But it turns out that's not the case. The larger the church is, the more it should rely on metrics. If you've got a church of 2,000, you need to know 
whether there's a 15% rise or drop in the small group attendance, in youth group attendance, in offerings that are being given, on people who are being called to ministry. High reliance on metrics is really helpful and gives you objective measurements on important things when a church is big. But the smaller a church gets, the less important metrics become. You never have no reliance on metrics. There's always some numbers that can be helpful. But in a church of 20 or a church of 50, percentage shifts up and down don't mean nearly as much because you can have massive shifts just week to week in a church of 20 or 50. Instead, you're going to understand how well things are going in the church or how poorly they're going by having conversations in the church lobby. It's one of the reasons why this podcast is called The Church Lobby, because you can get a better assessment of the true health of a church by conversations in a church lobby than you can by what's happening on stage or by the numbers in the books. So we have an over-reliance on metrics. We think that more metrics is always better, and it's not necessarily so. The smaller the church, the less helpful metrics are. The bigger the church, the more helpful metrics are. But when we're obsessed with numbers, we make metrics the most important thing of all in every situation, and it's not. So, gets to question number five. How do we fix this? Well, I have several ideas that I list in my book. In the, la the last three uh, chapters are entitled Desizing the Pastor, Desizing the Congregation, and Desizing Evangelicalism. But before I get to those three chapters, I have two chapters where I really make the big turn in the book. The first of those two chapters is this. Discipleship fixes everything. We need a renewal of discipleship in the church. This is what Jesus called us to do. He did not call us to make converts. He did not call us to make bigger churches. He called us to make disciples. Here's how important discipleship is. I'm going to ask you, can you name a problem in the church that discipleship will not fix? That's why I entitled it, Discipleship Fixes Everything. I dare you to name a problem in the church that discipleship will not fix. Financial problem, discipleship fixes that. Moral problem, discipleship fixes it. Immaturity, disunity, discipleship fixes it, discipleship fixes it. That the only thing discipleship isn't bound to fix in your church is the size of your church. First of all, because your size is not a problem to fix. And secondly, because there will be times if you choose discipleship that going the discipleship route will actually go the opposite of the bigness route. So there are times, and I've talked to pastors, I talked to a pastor just today who chose discipleship and because of that went through years of decline before it finally settled in and before the maturity finally started to take root. And now they're growing and building and getting better and having real effective ministry even at a decreased size from what they were when they were bigger. Discipleship fixes everything. And the second one is this. Integrity is the new competence. For two generations, we've taught pastoral technique, methods, ideas, innovations, technology. We took integrity for granted. We assumed everybody was behaving themselves, and now let's teach you some technique to do some cool new stuff. And as we've learned over the last few years, we have a crisis of integrity. Integrity is the new competence. Integrity cannot be assumed anymore. Integrity must be taught. Integrity has to be prayed for. Integrity has to be worked on. Integrity, we have to be accountable for our integrity. How dangerous is our lack of integrity? Here's a quote that I'll give you straight from Desizing the Church. Quote, no one who has deconstructed their faith has done so because they saw a deficiency in the technical excellence of church services. Close quote. Think about that. Have you talked about to anybody who said, I've left the faith or I'm deconstructing my faith, who will point back to, well, you know, uh, I, I wanted to go to a church, but it wasn't getting any bigger, so what could I believe? Or they just didn't have a cool band, so I don't believe in Jesus anymore. No, they might go to a different church <laughs> because you don't have your technical things straight, but they're not going to reject the faith because you don't have your technique in order. What will cause them to leave the faith or deconstruct their faith or question their faith is a lack of integrity in the church leaders. That's where it comes from all the time. So can you be big and have integrity? Yes, you can be big and have integrity. But you cannot pursue bigness and keep your moral integrity. There will be times when bigness will call you to compromise your integrity. So here's my advice. Instead of setting bigger plans, 
we need to set a moral compass. Well, thanks for being with me today for the first of several podcasts that are based on my book that just came out on April the 2nd, Desizing the Church, How Church Growth Became a Science, Then an Obsession, and What's Next. It's available anywhere you buy books, but we also have a link in the show notes that you can click on to buy it for yourself. I encourage you to stick around for these next podcasts that are coming up. We're going to put them out one a week instead of one of every two weeks, which is our normal pace. We've got interviews coming up with Scott McKnight, with Caitlin Beatty, with Bob Smetana, with Wynn Collier, and others as well. And we may even add some as we go along as we're having fun with this. But I encourage you to pick up Desizing the Church. I encourage you to come back and listen to the interviews that are coming up. And even more than that, I want to encourage you to ask yourself, have I become obsessed with bigness? This is not just a big church pastor's problem. This is a problem that is endemic to the church no matter what your size. We need to shift back to what Jesus called us to and not just simply what the culture around us is calling us to. Let's desize the church and let's elevate Jesus in the process. This episode was produced by Veronica Beaver. It was edited by Phil Vaders. Original theme music was written and performed by Jack Wilkins of jackwilkinsmusic.com. The graphic design is by Solomon Joy. And me, I'm Carl Vaders, and I hope to talk with you again in the church lobby.